I'm gonna have a quick question for each of you, um, and then also feel free in your answers to elaborate if you wanna to touch on some of the points some of the others made, and then after that we'll go to the audience for some questions. But um, Doug, first of all, thanks very much again for outlining the three stalemates. Um, the question there I'd have is on the regional one in particular, I think you were you know, very you know, clearly articulated in terms of, you know, we have greater interest in some of the neighboring countries than maybe we do in Afghanistan. But I guess my question is, is that because we've actually been in Afghanistan and lowered the threat in Afghanistan, for example, again, in terms of transnational terrorist groups there because of our presence? And so actually, if we left, would Afghanistan rise in terms of the threat level and potentially become one of our biggest threats in the region? So again, is it the presence that has actually reduced the threat, which is why our, our interest in some of the neighboring countries have, have risen? And um, Laurel, a very, uh, in term, I guess for me the question is the importance of the region, but the, how do, what kind of strategic communications strategy would we need to actually convince them that this is indeed uh, our strategy, that peace is a priority for the U.S. in the region, as, as opposed to, say, our CT objectives? Because again, a lot of the focus, as we've already discussed, is on troop numbers and our military presence, um, uh, and I don't think we've had coherence within the USG in terms of what exactly are our, our key priorities there. So if we were to try to rebuild a strategic consensus for stability in Afghanistan, I absolutely agree. It's going to depend on convincing them actually our plan A is to bring uh, reduce violence levels through some kind of political settlement in Afghanistan. Um, plan B might still be that actually if we fail in that, we have to remain engaged to make sure the state doesn't collapse, which could then really threaten the region as well. But how do we convince them that plan A is indeed our, t our top priority? Barney, not specific to your presentation now, but I know you just got back from Russia. Um, I would suspect that some of your discussions there had something to do with Afghanistan, and uh, yeah, I know you've also been long been involved in, uh, in the U.S.-China dialogues on Afghanistan, and I was wondering if you could say, we haven't really mentioned China, uh, and I was wondering if you could speak a little bit more in terms of the China-Russia angle here. Um, uh, and then Chris, you touched on it in terms of like, the domestic challenges, but say we have a successful strategic communication to convince the region we want peace and they're gonna become more consensus in terms of, of, of that peace. Uh, perhaps we, through our strategy, we get the Taliban to agree that you know we want to sit down and have negotiations. In some ways, I'm wondering if the biggest challenge might not be actually the other Afghan political actors and political elites, uh, many of whom benefit from the status quo. And we've seen the difficulty of a power sharing agreement that we tried to broker just between, in terms of Ghani and Abdullah and the constituencies they represent. Um, presumably bringing the Taliban into the equation, more power would need to be shared. And again, the winners and losers in that process. And so building domestic consensus aside from the Taliban, what, how do you see that being done? So. So my uh, homework assignment is, has our presence uh, actually decreased the threat and uh, in relative terms made uh, more important the, uh, the U.S. interests uh, on the periphery uh, in the neighborhood? I'd argue that, yeah, I think that's right, but this is longstanding. I mean, this happened within weeks of the intervention. I mean, you know, the, there hasn't been al-Qaeda in any significant numbers in Afghanistan largely since Tora Bora, right? Now, okay, for those who really study this, is this guy, Farouk al Qatani? He lived in the mountains somewhere. <laughs> when we were at our peak, 100,000 Americans, we couldn't find this guy, okay? Uh, and then I think he fell off the mountain or something. Something happened to him, I don't know, in a dark night. And now he's gone too, okay? All right, well, great. But did he really present a transnational threat for those seven years when he lived in Afghanistan and we couldn't find him and he was a card carrying member of Al Qaeda? I'd say no, okay? And if, if that's the bar, I mean, every last Al Al Qaeda member, well, there's probably 30 or 40 other countries around the world. In fact, I'd argue today Yemen and maybe Somalia present more um, meaningful safe havens for transnational terrorists uh, and probably a number of other states like uh, Syria, uh, potentially Iraq, uh, Libya, and so forth. Uh, so, 
I mean, I think that's kind of the low bar. I, I don't, I no longer buy, look, I was inspired by 9-11 too, right? But I no longer buy the notion that we should invest 25 billion, by the way, at the peak, it was 120 billion a year, okay, to, to diminish the potential of transnational terrorist safe haven. That's an unpayable bill because it applies to so many different places. So, yeah, we've substantially reduced the threat, but that happened within weeks of the intervention. 